Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for March 2024. This month's highlights include a meeting of the Moon and Jupiter in Taurus, the planet Mercury, the Apennine Mountains on the Moon and our constellation of the month which is Canis Minor. Let's begin by looking at the planets and we'll start with Jupiter since it's already visible on my screen. So you can see here that on the 1st of March at around 8 o'clock, so a little after sunset, looking towards the southwest, we can see Jupiter. Jupiter is best observed at the beginning of the month because as the month goes on, it slowly descends into the evening twilight and becomes harder to spot. Also, we have the effect of the light, the nights getting lighter, which adds to that as well. If we compare the, the 1st of March to the 30th of March, you can really see the drop in altitude. So by the time we get to the 30th of March, it isn't getting dark until after seven o'clock. And then um, you can see that Jupiter is going to set before nine o'clock. So you only get, really get a little bit of time with Jupiter by the time we get to the end of the month. So the early part of the month is best for Jupiter. And before we do lose it to the evening twilight, it's worth taking an opportunity to see it with the crescent moon in the middle of the month on the 13th and the 14th of March. So I'm going to take us back to about seven o'clock so we can just see the view as the sun is setting and the sky is getting darker. So the best time to go out is just after sunset when the sky is starting to darken you should very easily be able to spot the moon and Jupiter on the 13th. If we zoom in a little bit, take a closer look. So you've got the crescent moon here. You've got very bright planet Jupiter. You've also got Uranus up here. So you, you can have a go at spotting Uranus with your binoculars or small telescope if you have one. Um, Uranus is a tricky object to spot with the naked eye. Um, it's right on the limit of naked eye visibility so I would recommend a pair of binoculars at least for Uranus or a small telescope. Jupiter and the moon will be nice and easy and you've also got the Pleiades open star cluster and the Hyades triangular cluster that makes up the head of Taurus the bull. So lots and lots of interesting objects in this part of the sky um, to view with your, your naked eye, be able to see all of these things with your naked eye or if you have um, a pair of binoculars or a, a small telescope then you can have a go with those as well. Let's take a look at the other evening planet that I'd like to talk to you about this month now which is the planet Mercury. Mercury is improving as the month goes on, so the opposite to Jupiter, it's better to observe Mercury later in the month rather than at the beginning. In the early part of the month, you're unlikely to be able to spot it at all because it will set quite shortly after the sun and you, you won't be able to pick it out of the, the twilight around sunset. Um, from about the middle of the month, then um, Mercury will be setting much later, about 90 minutes after the sun which gives you a good opportunity to find it once the sky starts to get a little bit dark. I'm going to start from the 11th, which is about the earliest that I would try. So you want to go uh, and look at your western horizon around half an hour, from around half an hour after sunset. So sunset um, in Leicester on the 11th of March will be around six o'clock. So I'm going to look from around half past six. And you can see that one of the reasons I've chosen the 11th as the first day to have a look is because there's this lovely crescent moon um, visible on the 11th, um, quite close to Mercury. So um, it's a thin crescent moon. It won't be that easy to spot, especially when the sky isn't very dark. But you can sweep around your western horizon with your pair of binoculars, see if you can spot the thin crescent moon and the planet Mercury. I suspect Mercury is behind this unhelpful tree for me. So I'm going to change my landscape to see if I can get a better horizon. There we go. Um, something that you unfortunately can't do in real life is change your landscape so that you have a nice flat horizon. But it does illustrate the importance of not having anything or, or too many objects in the way um, obscuring the horizon. So you can see we've got Mercury here, we've got the crescent moon, and then if I go onwards into the evening, we've got Mercury all the way until about seven o'clock. And then as we go through the month, you 
can see mercury really getting higher and higher and higher as the month goes on so that by the time you reach the end of the month here we go all the way up to the 30th you've got mercury for quite a long time after sunset and the sky is even getting quite dark before you lose mercury so March is a really really good opportunity to see the planet mercury which is often quite elusive because we don't get it for very much um, time after the sun sets or before the sun rises so starting from the middle of the month or maybe even the 11th if you want to try and catch it with that crescent moon see if you can spot the planet mercury I want to go to our final planet that I'm going to talk to you about this month now which is Venus and Venus is a morning planet during March and its visibility gets worse as the month goes on and you're really only going to be able to spot Venus at the beginning of the month um, and it still doesn't rise that much before the sun even at the start of March so I'm going to go to the 1st of March and I'm going to go to about 6 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to change my view back to the previous one because it tends to be a bit better in terms of having a, a reasonably clear horizon. I'm just going to scroll around to the, the southeast. So I'm at the 1st of March and I'm up first thing in the morning around 6 o'clock looking towards the southeast and I'm waiting to see Venus rising and there it is. And you can see the sun getting ready to rise over here and sunrise um, in Leicester area. Leicester, London, will be around quarter to seven on at the beginning of March. So you don't get very long with Venus before the sun rises. And just do be careful if you're observing um, around the eastern horizon first thing in the morning that you don't damage your eyes um, with the sun rising. So you can spot Venus right at the beginning of the month. And as you could see when I just um, zoomed in on it, it's showing a gibbous phase, which you can try and pick out with your small telescope if you have one. The, the tricky thing will be to spot it, first of all. And you can sweep around with your binoculars and, and see if you can spot it. We have also got Mars over here. Um, alongside Venus at the beginning of the uh, uh, at the beginning of the month, Mars will be very very difficult to spot. Um, but if you like an extra challenge, then um, you can see if you can spot the red planet as well at the same time. Let's take a look at the moon now. So the full moon in March is known as the Worm Moon and is on March the twenty fifth, Monday, March the twenty fifth, and. The, known as the worm moon because it is said to be when the worms start emerging from the soil as things warm up or also um, the emergence of the larvae of the worm beetle as well is another um, place that the origin of the name worm moon might come from. So the 25th of March is the full moon and the target that I would like to focus on for our moon watch this month is the Apennine mountain range on the moon, named after the Apennine mountain range in Italy. And uh, last month we looked at as our target uh, for the month the Mare Imbrium or the Sea of Showers, which I'm ringing with my mouse now. And the Sea of Showers is adjacent to the Sea of Serenity, which is this one here. And the Apennine mountain range is these mountains that are between those two seas. And they are best observed with a small telescope. And the best time of the month to observe them is around first quarter, which is halfway between the new moon and the full moon. Um, and the reason that it's a good time to observe them at first quarter is because they cast spectacular shadows across the plane and you'll be able to see the, um, the interplay between light and shadow that makes things stand out so much more than when you try to observe these things when they're um, illuminated overhead at full moon. So um, around first quarter is the best time, but any time in the month you can have a go with your binoculars or your small telescope and see if you can um, spot anything interesting in this area between the Sea of Showers and the Sea of Serenity. 
And if we take a look at the first quarter moon, so we need, um, there's two weeks between new moon and full moon, so we need to go back by about a week. Um, and here we can see um, we have the first quarter moon. Um, the Apollo 15 mission, by the way, landed um, next to the Apennine Mountains. And when you look at uh, images from the Apollo 15 mission, you can s often see um, the peak of Mount Hadley, um, which is one of the mountains um, just next to the landing site. And if we have a look over the days around um, first quarter, you can see how the terminator of the moon sort of traverses over the Apennine Mountains over that few days. So um, definitely worth observing around um, the 16th, 17th, 18th of March if you can, if you are looking to have a look at that mountain range. Let's take a look at our constellation of the month now. And after looking at Canis Major last month, I thought we could take a closer look at its smaller sibling this month, which is Canis Minor. So you can see here that I am looking towards the south um, a little bit after sunset, a couple of hours after sunset in the middle of March. And if I put the constellation art on, you can see Orion the Hunter depicted here this large hunting hunting dog of Canis Major that we talked about last month and the small hunting dog of Canis Minor up here and you can see that Canis Major has its very bright star the brightest star in the night sky Sirius and known as the dog star and um, Canis Minor has Procyon um, which is an, another uh, bright star not quite so bright as Sirius but still very bright and is known as the little dog star you can also see that sometimes Canis Minor is depicted as riding on the back of Monoceros, the unicorn, as well. Procyon is very useful to us for spotting Canis Minor because it's a really tiny constellation. It only has two named stars, Procyon and Gomesa, and it's the 71st largest out of 88 constellations. So if it wasn't for this nice bright star, it would be very inconspicuous to us. It, the reason that Procyon appears so brightly to us is because it's only 11 light years away um, and it's a double star um, with a larger star, Procyon A, which is nearing the end of its life and will soon enter the red giant stage of its evolution and a companion white dwarf star, Procyon B, um, which is really faint and you would need a large telescope to be able to see it. The name Procyon means before the dog because it rises slightly before Sirius in the evening. And the two dog stars, so Procyon and Sirius, along with Betelgeuse in Orion, uh, make up the asterism of the winter triangle. So that's another thing that you can have a go at spotting. So when you go out um, in the evening and have a look for Canis Minor, when you've found it, see if you can link these three stars together to the winter triangle. And if I take off the constellation lines and names and put on the asterism lines and names, you can see the winter triangle depicted here. And they're also part of a larger asterism, which you can have a go at spotting, um, which is the winter circle. Um, and you can see the winter circle going around over here so a much larger shape in the night sky and these are all bright stars so um, they shouldn't be too difficult to spot on a clear night so we start with um, Sirius in Canis Major and then Procyon in Canis Minor and then you've got the uh, twins in Gemini Castor and Pollux someone seemed to let me click on that one Castor and Pollux and um, then Capella in Auriga and then down to um, the angry eye of the bull, um, Aldebaran, Aldebaran in uh, Taurus. And then finally, Rigel on the foot of Orion the hunter. And all of those stars um, make up the winter triangle. So, uh, sorry, the winter circle, sometimes um, known as the winter hexagon as well. It's quite e interesting, I think, when you leave the take off the constellation names and lines and leave the asterism ones on instead and it gives you quite a different view of the night sky compared to what we are used to thinking about it might be interesting to do one of these what's in the night sky sessions where we just talk about all the different asterisms that we can spot 
that brings me to the end of our night sky tour for March and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.